God Almighty, you have made a way where there seemed to be no way. To those who are wandering, and that's every one of us, you opened, our ar- you opened your arms and you made a way. And you opened not just hope in this life, but heaven for eternity. And so we pray that today as we open your word, as we meet together as your people, whether we're uh, in homes or, or traveling in a hotel somewhere online or in the courtyard or the family worship venue or here in the worship center, wherever we are today, um, let us know that your arms are open wide. You are the God who has said, come to me, all you who weary and who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Let us find our rest and our, and our peace and our hope in you this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. I'm fine. No problems here. Everything's great. I mean, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. How you feeling? Great, great, wonderful. How's your marriage going? Perfect. No problems here. Now why, why would you ask? Everything's great. How are you doing emotionally in this? It's been a challenging couple of years. I'm fine. Look at the smile on my face. I'm great, man. No, no worries, right? You done that before? Everything's great. You know, th- this is the temptation. A red light comes on the dashboard of your car, and you think, oh, that's colorful. Um, <laughs> you don't think, take it to the mechanic, check out what's wrong. The, the red light stays on. You know, it's probably one of those ones that comes on over so many miles, and it's probably nothing wrong. Smoke starts kind of coming up out of the hood of the car. It's going to be, if I just ignore it, it'll go away. That, we can live that way in, in so many areas of life. You know, you, you go, oh, oh, I've had this pain in my chest. It's, it's like piercing in my chest. How long have you had it? I, no, it's no big deal. It's just about five weeks. Going, you haven't had it checked? I'm fine. You, you're starting to get the picture? I mean, we, we, we can live this way. There's relational tension, but we want to look the other way and act like it's not there. Financial challenges. You know, I guess if I keep spending the way I'm spending in, in two weeks and a week, and oh, I'm out of money. But I don't want to think about it, so I'll just put it on the credit card. I mean, there's so many things in life where we just look the other way and keep pressing on. And, and the passage of Scripture we're going to look at today, the, 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 the sixth and seventh letters to the churches in the book of Revelation, will be in Revelation chapter 3, so the letter of the church of Philadelphia, Philadelphia and the letter of the church of Laodicea are kind of a wake-up call where Jesus is coming and saying, things aren't fine. Wake up, pay attention. And, and we can kind of respond by going, oh, no, but no, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Things are fine. I'm thankful that at 13 years old, I learned probably in the most profound way in my life the value of somebody loving someone enough to come to them and say, there's a problem. And if you don't deal with it right now, it could blow your life up. And that person for me was my granny. My dad's mom we called granny. My mom's mom we called grandma. So my dad's mom was granny. And a granny came to me at 13 years old, and she sat me down. And she says, Kevin, I want to talk with you. And she sat me down, and she walked me through my family history. She told me the story of my family. See, because if you looked at my family, nice middle-class family, Orange County, California, sunny days, hanging out at the beach in the summertime, life was good, life was fine. But she kind of said to me, Kevin, I love you, so you need to know everything's not fine. She said, my first husband, McGargy, I'm by, by blood, I'm not a Harney, I'm a McGargy. But she said, my first husband, who was your, dad's, was your dad's dad, said they found him dead in the gutter. He was a drunk. He wasn't just an alcoholic, he was a drunk. He died when my dad was quite young. And left my granny alone with three kids. So she told me the story of McGargy and, and his alcoholism. She told me the story of his dad and how he had died from alcoholism and of the, his dad before him. And then she looked at me and she said, Kevin, your dad is an alcoholic. I just thought my dad always had a glass of wine in his hand and it was always full. He was drinking it all the time, but it was always full. It was kind of a, a miracle, I suppose. But um, I mean, he just... And I knew as the evening went on, he got more and more friendly uh, and was more prone to say yes to things I would ask him. I mean, but, that was, but, but, but my granny said, she said, your, your father, my firstborn son, Terry, is an alcoholic. And she said, I don't want you to be the next generation of men. I was the firstborn son in our family. She said, I don't want you to be the next generation of men in our family who is an alcoholic. She said, promise me you won't start drinking. I was 13. I said, well, I can't promise that. I'd already started drinking. Not a lot, but a little bit. She said, well, promise me you'll never drink again. 
I'm 13. I didn't grow up in a Christian. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't planning on being a pastor, but she's promised me I'll never drink again. I looked in the eyes of my granny, who I loved, and I said, I promise you I'll never drink again. I've kept that promise to this day by God's grace. But here's, but, but here's the point. Here's the point. Um, the point is not what I've done. The point is what she did. She loved me enough to look at me and tell me the story, tell me the truth. Because here's the reality about me. I am not a moderate personality, <laughs> right? I love my wife. Yeah, I'm crazy about her. I love Mexican food. Yes, I'm crazy about it. I love golf. I love golf. I love Jesus. I'm crazy for Jesus. I think if I was drinking, I'd, I think if I was drinking, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Probably wouldn't be your pastor. I probably, might not be alive. Because that generational alcoholism has gone down to my siblings, just not to me. Not all of them, but we've had some alcoholism in my siblings, but not to me because of that moment. When Jesus comes to us, when Jesus comes to the church in Revelation and says, let me tell you the truth, it's not to be angry or judgmental or mean to his people. It's the same spirit that my granny came to me. It's out of love. And so we're going to see this, this idea of learning to speak the truth to ourselves uh, and to ourselves and about ourselves and really speak the truth to God. So each week as we are walking through the letters of the churches in Revelation, uh, we, we begin by talking about getting the picture. That because there's, there's this, this kind of vision aspect to Revelation that we need to kind of see what's going on. I want to begin, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation 3, beginning in verse 7. We'll start in the letter to the church of Philadelphia. But there's, there's some pictures that get painted in our minds that we should see as we read these passages. So here's the first picture. And I'm going to ask you if you can kind of see it as I read the passage. Can you see the God who is sovereign over all? The word sovereign means absolute ruler over. He's the sovereign. He's the king. He, kind of, he rules over all. In this passage, we're going to see the sovereignty, the power, the majesty of God. Look with me at Revelation 3, beginning in verse 7. This is the sixth of the seven churches. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write... These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the keys of David. It's a picture of authority. Listen to this. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds, he says. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Can you see the the authority, the power, the sovereignty of God Almighty and of Jesus Christ? He says, the doors I open, you can't shut. The doors I close, you can't open. He rules, he reigns, he's in charge, and he's put an open door in front of us. We're gonna see what that open door is. That open door is Jesus. But he says, I put an open door before you that nobody can shut. Can you see the sovereignty of God as we read this letter to the church of Philadelphia? Here's the next question. Can you see the God who is just and will make all things right? Our God is a just God, a righteous God. He will make all things right. So listen as we continue the passage in verse 9. I will make those who are a synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. He says, not only am I sovereign, but I'm going to make things right. There's things that are wrong here. There's lies. There's deceit going on. He says, but I'm going to make it right. Those who are lying and deceiving, they're going to come and kneel down. He's saying, listen, I'm going to make things right. Don't you need to hear a message right now in our crazy upside-down world from the God who says, listen, I know there's times where things are unjust and unrighteous and wrong, but I'm the God who's going to make things right. Get that picture in your mind, a God who is sovereign over all. What he closes, no one can open. What he opens, no one can close. A God who's going to make all things right. And then another question. Can you see the God who loves you more than you can imagine? There's a picture of God in here that is so intimate and so personal, and if we're not not careful, we could miss it. But look at verse 12 of Revelation chapter 3. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. And I love this. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. He says, I'm going to write on each of them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. That idea of putting a name on something is, is, is an idea of identity, right? Think about it with kids. When you give kids things, sometimes you'll put their name on it so that they'll know it's theirs or so if they lose it, somebody else will say, oh, that's theirs, their name is on it. So 
so here, you know, here's, here's Sydney's, you know, my, my, my first purse, right? But it's, it's you go, okay, it's, it's been named. It's, it's personalized. And then Alyssa's first piggy bank, saving for, for something, saving her nickels and dimes and quarters, right? Matthew's first backpack. So he, he goes to school, and there's, there's, there's three, kids at, you know, three kids at school that have the same backpack, but his name is on it. You know who it belongs to. But even more so, here's a, an interesting kind of name tag. And picture what kind of dog. What dog would you picture with this one? Diesel. Probably like a little chihuahua, maybe, you know, not sure. But, but the thing about this, you know, a good dog name tag, right, has something on the other side. You know what it is? It's a phone number, and it's a name, in case that dog wanders off. And, and that phone number or name are a, a, a name and a location to be able to bring that dog home if it gets lost, a call, Right? And, and, I, and I love how in this passage we read these words. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. A name and a location. A name and an address. You want to talk about personal. God says, I will write on your soul my name and my address because you're that precious to me. Do you understand and that's, that's, the, that's a vision of God. He is so personal. He's not removed. He's not distanced. He's not disconnected. He's, God is more engaged with us than, than we even comprehend or understand. His intimacy and his care for us is unbelievable. And so to get that vision, that vision of God's sovereignty, of God's justice, of God's love, that's the God we're celebrating. That's the God who, who is reaching out to his church then and reaches out to his church, his people now. And reaches out to those who aren't yet part of his church, part of his family, but he loves and wants to come and know him. So we get kind of that picture in our mind. We get the vision. Now we kind of walk into getting the message. Each week we talk about what's the message coming through the scriptures? Understanding God's truth. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 3, 14 and following. This is the, the letter to the church in Laodicea. And here's what I want you to notice as I read this letter. I want you to notice the heart and the tone of Jesus that's a lot like my granny's heart and tone when she came to me. And said, Kevin, I love you, and I want the best for you. I want you to hear how the heart of God, the heart of Jesus Christ himself, is speaking to his church, saying, I love you so much, I'm going to tell you the truth. And hear it from that tone of love. Revelation 3, 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen. This is talking about Jesus. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. He says, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. He doesn't say I'm going to. He says it's getting close. He says it's a warning, right? I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Now listen to this. You say, I'm fine. You say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I do not need a thing. He says that's how you're perceiving yourself. That's how you're acting. Listen to the heart of God. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. That's not an insult. That's God saying you're acting like everything's fine, but I know it's not. I know the brokenness of your soul. So what does God say? I'm going to give you a solution. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, true riches, eternal riches. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. God says, I want to cover that. I don't want you to live in that shame. And salve to put on your eyes so you can see. God says, I want to give you riches. I want to cover your shame. I want to help you see. That's the heart of God. But he's saying, but you're kidding yourself saying you're fine. I'm telling you you're not, and I'm telling you how you get there. And then verse 19. Those whom I love, God says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Any good parent, grandparent, aunt, or uncle knows when you really love somebody, you'll point out what's wrong. Those, you know, that's, what my, that's what my granny did for me, right? He, say, he says, those who I, who am I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Turn around. Stop heading the direction you're heading. Here I am, Jesus says. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. In the ancient world, as in our world, inviting someone into your home and sharing a meal at the table is one of the most intimate things you can do. This is, this is God saying, I want to come and be in relationship with you. 
To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Can you hear what the Spirit of God is saying to all those who will hear, all those who will receive? So, so there's some, just some simple truths, messages that we should hear in this passage. Here's the first one. Our creator is a faithful and true witness. Verse 14 says, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Don't you kind of want to hear someone who's actually faithful in telling the truth? I, I, I'm at a point now where, you know, you know there's all, been all this talk of fake news, fake news. I'm at the point now where I listen to almost any news and I'm kind of like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle. Or I just, it's like, I just, it just... And, and, and then you turn to Jesus, he says, I, am not only, I will not only speak the truth to you, he says, I am the truth. Man, we need that. If you're feeling disillusioned, man, look to Jesus. He is faithful and he is true. And then another message that we see in verses 15 and 16. It is time to make up your mind, get off the fence, and turn up the temperature. Jesus is saying, you know, decide what you want to do with your faith. Decide what you want to do with walking with me. There's this middle ground, neither hot nor cold, not a good thing. He says, I know your deeds, verse 15, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. It's a time of passive apathy. And God says, let's have some passion. You know, to, to passive apathy, oh, I don't know, I don't care. Man, there's a lot of that in our world today. People are just kind of discouraged, disheartened. It's kind of like, I'm just going to, wait and see what happens. And she says, man, I don't, that, that, this middle ground, he says, you know, and I think what, he's, what he, he's saying, I wish you were either hot or cold. He's not saying get cold. He's saying, turn up the temperature, man. Fire it up. Live for me. Follow me. Have some passion for me. Live out your life of faith with passion. And then another message that comes through. That God calls us to open our eyes and see ourselves as we really are. In, in verse 17, he's saying, open your eyes. Acknowledge your need of me. Acknowledge where you're really at. You notice, notice the red light blinking on your dashboard. Notice the pain in your chest. Notice the relational tension that's coming apart. No, don't keep going. Ah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Open your eyes. So in verse 17, Jesus says, you know, you say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I do not need a thing. Got it all together. And, and I believe with incredible tenderness and love, Jesus says, but you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And you go, well, that doesn't sound very nice. No, maybe not. What my granny told me about my family wasn't the nicest thing to say, but it's true. And it's changed my life. When someone told me about Jesus and I met the truth, it's changed my life. Hard moments when the truth comes your way. But will we listen, will we hear, will we respond to the truth? When is it easy to self-deceive? When it is, we need to be honest with ourselves and God. We live in a time of, we, our, our ability for self-deception is just so powerful. Say, God, I don't want to do that. I want to hear the truth. And then one more message that comes through this passage. God is ready and willing to make us new. The God that we gather to worship today, wherever you're gathered right now, wherever we are, we're, we're in different places scattered around this country, probably around the world, uh, and, and that are listening online, and you, know, and, and, and you say, okay, you know, what, what is, um, you know, what is uh, it that we need to finally recognize uh, and, and be willing to say, God, you know, make me new. Where, where am I broken? Where am I struggling? Where am I hurting? And so we've got to finally confess our need for God. And so, and so each week as we walk through Revelation, we talk, we talk about, okay, what's the vision? What do we see? We need to see God as a starting point. God is sovereign. God is just and righteous. God is loving. Then we've got to hear a message. God, what do you want to speak to me today? But if we stop there, all we've done is, is, is kind of got a perspective from God's perspective. We've been honest about ourselves, but we're not moving to action. And so each week we ask this question, how do we get a move on it? How do we, how do we take action in our life, in our personal lives, and within the church? What is the action God wants us to take? And so we have some I wills. And here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you just to kind of quiet your heart right now, wherever you are. And, and as, I, as I walk through these declarations that really grow out of the biblical text, I want to ask you, are you ready to say this today? Between you and God. No one's going to sit next to you and say, are you, are you? This is just between you and God. 
But here's the first one. I will receive the amazing grace of God offered in Jesus the Messiah. Will you say, I will, just, I will just right now open myself to receive the amazing grace of God. If you're not a Christian, it may be receiving that grace for the first time. If you are a Christian, it might be receiving that grace for the hundredth time. But we need to say, God, I need your grace. I need your care. I need your presence in my life. The pastor says, you say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are pitiful, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And then he says this, I counsel to you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you become, become truly rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Here's the question. Will I receive and delight in the good gifts God offers every day of my life? Will I say, God, I receive your grace. I walk in your grace. You know, if you want to make an impact in this world, you've got to be filled up with something to overflow. And God's grace is the best thing to be filled with because he looks at you and he loves you. He delights in you. So will you say today, God, I want to be filled with your grace and I want to walk in that grace. Here's the second question. This one's a little bit tougher. And the second declaration. I will accept the loving discipline of my heavenly father. Will you say, God, I will accept your loving discipline. I will accept if you want to sit me down and tell me the truth and tell me my story. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you've come to the cross, you receive Jesus, but you're wandering from the path and you're not living how you want to, you know that God wants you to live. Are you, will you listen? You know, here, here's what the passage says. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. The word repent means you're heading a certain direction. It's specifically the wrong direction. And repentance is this. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to walk where God wants me to walk. In today's service, we're doing something a little bit different because we only sang one song to kind of open the service. We're going to have a couple more songs a little bit later in the service. And during that time, we're going to invite people that want prayer, that, that, that want to say, I want to come and ask for prayer. And maybe there's an area in your life where there's brokenness or you need healing or you need a touch of God or you need to turn around. Maybe there's addiction you're battling that's going on in your life right now or a relationship that's broken and conflicted and you've been acting like it's fine, it's fine, but today God's saying, this is the time to come and ask God to heal, to restore, to give a new beginning. In, a, in just in, in a few minutes, I'm gonna invite a team of people to come. We're gonna have actually prayer teams. We had, and we had people, and also there'll be, there'll be somebody out in the courtyard at the right side of the screen in the family worship venue, on the right side of the screen in the family worship venue, and online, we're gonna have a number you can call, and we have a bunch of, we have more teams of people for prayer. We have three, more, three times more team than we normally have online as well to pray for you. But if you say, man, I, I just wanna come before God today, and say, I got an area in my life that needs restoration, that needs healing, that needs a new beginning. And I need the power of God unleashed in my life. We want to pray for you. And if you're on campus, wherever you go for prayer, if you desire it, our team members would be willing to anoint you with oil, which means, and that oil is a picture through the Old Testament and New Testament of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So if you ask for anointing, they'll, they'll place oil, they'll, they'll put the sign of the cross on your forehead, and they'll, they'll anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then they're going to say, so they're going to ask, would you like me to anoint you? And we'll only do it if you ask us to. And then they're going to say, is it okay if we put a hand on your shoulder as we pray? And we're actually going to ask for permission. This is the world we're in right now. We're very careful about those things, but we're going to ask that question. And then we're going to pray for whatever it is you're wanting prayer for. If, if, you're, if you're saying, I'm dealing with physical brokenness right now, and I'm, I'm praying for God's healing touch on my body, we're going to pray for that. If you say, I'm in a broken relationship right now and I'm praying that God will heal that relationship, we're gonna pray for that for you. If you say, my financial world's upside down and I've got myself in all kinds of trouble and I don't know how to fix this, but I need God to step in and, and not you know, like snap, but teach me how to live in a new way and make some good decisions, but I'll partner with God in changing that and have God's power unleashed in your life, we wanna pray for that. If you're in a time of emotional turmoil, there's a lot of that in our world today. We wanna pray for God's healing in your emotional world, whatever it is. And so when that time comes, I'll give you some instructions, but... But part of it's saying, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually look and say, you're the one who wants to heal me, who wants to restore me. You love me enough to point those things out, and I'm going to turn and cry out to you for your power and your strength. Here's another declaration. I will freely repent and turn from my sins in the power of Jesus. He says, so be earnest and repent. Will you say today to God, God, this is the day. I'm ready to turn around and stop whatever that is. And that's why we're praying together because you may need to unleash God's power to make that turn. If you're dealing with an addiction or a struggle and you're saying, I don't, have the, I don't have the power to make that turn and repent, God does have the power. And we want to pray for that for you. 
So would you, would you make that declaration today? And then one more declaration. I will open the door and invite Jesus to be my closest friend, my savior, and my leader. For some of you, you'd say today, man, I've been coming to Shoreline. It's my first week at Shoreline. I've been coming for two months, or I've been coming for 25 years. But I've never come to the cross, come to Jesus, and said, Jesus, I need you to forgive me and to wash me clean and to lead my life. I want you to be my forgiver, my savior, but I want you to be my leader, my Lord. And I'm gonna take your hand and walk with you. Maybe some of you haven't come to that place before. And maybe this is the day. There were nine people in the first service between online and on campus that prayed for the first time to receive Jesus this morning. And I believe there's people right now. Yeah, amen. So praise God for that, right? Um, But I believe there's people right now online and on campus that you're saying, I wanna take that step. I wanna know this God who loves me, who's just, who's perfect, who's watching over me, who loves me enough to say, it's time to change. And so I'm gonna, have an, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lead in a time of prayer for that later in the service. But what I wanna do right now is I'm gonna tell you, I can tell you the whole story of Jesus in about two minutes. In about two minutes, because it's not very complicated. Here's the whole story of the good news of Jesus. There is a God who made you, who loves you, and who, who cares about you more than you imagine or dream. That's the beginning part. For God so loved the world. It starts with God's love. There is a God who made you and who loves you. And then there's a second part of the story. We've wandered from God. Our sins, our thoughts we should have thought of, the things we say we shouldn't say, things we do, our our sins, we wander from God and that separates us from God. He didn't leave us, we wandered from him and we're separate from him. Here's the third part of the story. There's God who loves us, who's seen us wander away. He doesn't want us to keep wandering. He wants us to come home. That's why we sung that song today, Homecoming, right? His arms are open. His heart is open. His, his, His home is open to you. And Jesus came to pay for all of our sins and all of our wrongs. We can't drag our sins with us into heaven. they got to be washed away. We couldn't pay the price. Jesus said, I'll go. I'll pay. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. And on the cross, he took our sins. He took our shame. He took our judgment. He took our punishment. He took it all on himself. And he died in our place for our sins. And three days later, he rose again. So there's a God who loves us. We've wandered from him because of our sin. We can't find our way back home. He came to seek us, to find us through Jesus Christ who paid the price, who's given a potential for all people who will receive him to have their sins washed away. Here's the last part. We decide if we want to receive that gift. God does not force us to believe in him and to receive his grace, but he offers it to everyone. And if today is the day that you say, I'm ready to receive that gift, I'm going to lead in a time of prayer at the end of our service. And, and, and so be, during these next two songs, will you pray about that? And will you say, is this, is this my moment? Is this my time to begin a whole new life and walk with Jesus and become part of God's family? Be praying about that. But right now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a time of worship and song. The worship, I'm gonna invite the worship team to begin moving back up here again to join me, and I'm gonna ask our prayer teams to come find your place at the front here. So our prayer teams come, and our prayer teams are all ready to pray with you. And I'm gonna ask you to do this during these next two songs. Some of you, you're gonna kind of stay where you're at. You're just gonna kind of be listening to the songs, worshiping and praying as we're together. And it's kind of a quiet moment. But for many of you, you're gonna say, you know what? I wanna experience God's healing in this relationship, in my financial, in my emotional life, in my physical life. And I would love to have somebody anoint me with oil and place a hand on my shoulder and pray in the power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ for God's healing and God's presence and God's work in your life. And so if you want to join us for prayer, I'm going to begin praying in just a moment here. And I'm going to ask you, when you, when you are, just stand up where you are and you can come up these, these two aisles right in the center of the worship center. And we've got two people here that will be ready and they'll kind of, kind of point to you when the spot's open. And we'll just keep directing people here for prayer. And our prayer team members will stay <clears throat> through these two songs. If there's people that still want prayer, they'll stay after the service. We want to pray with anybody who wants prayer. So I'm going to pray right now. As I pray, if you're like, man, I want prayer right now, just get up right now as I'm praying and begin to form lines in these two spots, and then we'll begin to direct you to prayer stations. Lord Jesus, we come together. And we don't want to be like the church at Laodicea. We don't want to be like we are sometimes where we're like, I'm fine, I'm good, I don't need anything. I got it all put together. But let us turn our hearts to you today and just say, Lord, I need prayer. I need encouragement. I need your power unleashed in my heart and in my soul.